This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good afternoon and welcome to the next panel, yet, a tablet. which dangerously in this postprandial environment is on understanding and measuring what works. This is a panel on, on data and data use. My name is George Rutherford. I'm a professor of epidemiology here at UCSF and I've had the great pleasure of working with Jaime, Haile, Richard, and all the rest for more than a decade now. So, I just thought I'd start off, since Richard gave this long, eloquent introduction, and at risk of, of him thinking I'm mocking his English background, uh, in 1611, King James I <laughs> granted a charter to the worshipful com company of parish clerks, probably clerks, uh, that imposed a duty to report reporting all burials in the city of London. While there was some underreporting. Roman Catholics and English dissenters were excluded, for instance. Uh, these reports, termed the Bills of Mortality, provided cause of death statistics for the City of London and its environments and, until the environs until the system was replaced in 1836 by the Births and Death Registration Act, which established a civil registration system for births, marriages, and deaths, replacing the increasingly dysfunctional parochial, meaning parish-based, uh, registration system. In the United States, early laws in Virginia and the Massachusetts colonies also required registrations of birth, deaths, and marriages. It was not until 1933, however, that all U.S. states had established systems for registering all live births and deaths. It's these systems that provide us with the vital statistics we know today. Unfortunately, not all countries have robust, robust systems of civil registration, leading us to have to extrapolate. Somewhat later, Reporting of communicable diseases became an important adjunct to public health programs. California, for instance, was the second state behind Massachusetts, for those of you who are wondering, to enact communicable disease reporting laws in 1871. These laws and the regulations that implement them require reporting both for public health actions, such as isolation, quarantine, post-exposure prophylaxis, as well as a general understanding of the distribution and burden of disease. However, there are few parallel systems for understanding non-communicable disease, morbidity, and, compar and comparing and contrasting the burden of individual diseases over time uh, and between countries. It was into this gap that the Global Burden of Disease Study stepped in 1990, producing a comprehensive regional and global assessment of mortality and disability from major diseases, injuries, and risk factors. The development of the Disability Adjusted Life Year, or DALI, was in particular a valuable tool to come out of the process and gave a standard metric by which not only the burden of disease could be measured across countries, but also through the Disease Control Priority Project across different interventions. So tracing the collection, collation, and use of data starts to sound like Alexander Langmuir now, uh, of, of data and strategic information from the worshipful company of parish clerks to modern surveillance, monitoring, and evaluation practice may seem like a bit of a stretch to some. However, these tools and the tools developed by modern epidemiology and evaluation sciences have been a key and possibly an underutilized key, as we'll hear later, to designing and conducting effective public health uh, programs today. It's this knowledge base to which we should, continue, we should continuously contribute as we implement and monitor our interventions, be they social, clinical, or structural. So in this afternoon's panel, we have four distinguished speakers whom I'll introduce now in order of their appearance. First, uh, Stefano Bertozzi is the Dean of the Public Health School, School of Public Health at the University of California, uh, Berkeley. And Dean Bertozzi will speak on the role evaluation plays in global health decision making and whether it's being under or over emphasized, that is uh, evaluation, not decision making. <laughs> Secondly, Dean Julio Frank of the Harvard School of Public Health will illustrate that formal evaluations can be embedded into the implementation of large-scale health system reform using, the, as an example, the efforts he led during his tenure as the Minister of Health of, of Mexico. Thirdly, Dr. Joy Lawn of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine 
will speak to the role of academia in strategic information, that is surveillance and monitoring and evaluation, and how we can train students and have them sustain academic careers in this important area of public health uh, practice. And finally, uh, last but not least, we'll hear from Professor Chris Murray of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation of the University of Washington on the importance of understanding the burden of disease and risk factors in evaluating interventions. So I'll ask each of them to come up here to the podium for five-ish minutes, uh, and then we'll uh, have a few questions and we can go to Q&A from the audience. Uh, Dean Bertozzi. Thank you, George. When George asked me to come up and speak on whether I thought there should be more or less evaluation, I thought that's like asking a window washing company whether Americans should wash their windows more often. <laughs> I think you know the answer to that question is yes. So instead of answering his question, I thought I'd make three points. The first one. <laughs> I don't think any of us are answering his question. <laughs> The first point I'd like to make is that decision makers only care about effectiveness and the academy produces efficacy. And we're still doing that, why? The second point I wanna make is that we in the academy are underappreciating the importance and value of naturally occurring heterogeneity and we're doing that at our peril. And the private sector is gonna eat our lunch as a result. And the third point, I want to make is that in evaluation, there's a valley of death that we need to fill, and that's the valley of death between what we do in the monitoring space and what we do in the impact evaluation space. So what do I mean by those three points? The first one, I find it fascinating that in public health and in much of medicine, we focus on efficacy trials, which produce results which are useless largely to decision makers trying to decide whether to do something or not do something. And why is it that we do that? It isn't that we don't understand the importance of effectiveness for decision makers. But all of our incentive structures are designed to make sure that that is dis discouraged. So what do we do? We make it harder to fund effectiveness trials and efficacy trials. We make it harder to publish them. And we make it harder to publish them because it's harder to get a 95% certain result in an effectiveness trial than it is in an efficacy trial. And we also say that, well, the FDA doesn't pay enough attention or other agencies don't pay enough attention to results that are effectiveness results. But what I find surprising is that we impose those constraints on ourselves because we, the Academy, determine what NIH study sections choose to fund, and we, the Academy, determine which articles are published in our most prestigious journals, and we, in the Academy, determine what are our criteria for advancement. And what I think is interesting, now that I sit on the Letters and Sciences campus, is that if you look at the departments of economics, sociology, political science, they are rewarded for tackling messy real world situations and dealing with messy data and extracting the best they can from it. We, on the other hand, in public health, have chosen to adopt the biomedical model coming from the laboratory where we do everything we can to perfectly control everything except that which we are experimenting with, right? And imagine the private sector, imagine Tide Detergent is going to launch a new detergent. So they're going to do their marketing research among, let's say, 20 to 4 to 25 year old women in Des Moines of Swedish origin, right? And that's really useful for marketing Tide to those women in Des Moines. But it's, you know, useless in Tanzania. And why is it that we discourage that which is important? And I think it's something that I think we need to grapple with. We don't have time to go into what my, what my suggested solutions are. Point number two. <laughs> Point number two, heterogeneity. Um, I find fascinating, I'm gonna use an HIV example. We have lots of people in this fabulous institution and elsewhere around the country who are trying to figure out how to get patients who are taking antiretrovirals to be more adherent to their medication. And what do we reward in the academy? We reward the brilliant individual who has a great idea for how he or she can improve adherence. Right? Meanwhile, the PEPFAR program in Africa is funding, I don't know, Eric's here, he can tell me, let's say 800 different treatment sites. And we know that some of those do a great job on adherence and other ones don't. So why don't we start by understanding and learning from the creativity and heterogeneity that exists, rather than running out and doing an extensive trial of my, Steph's, brilliant idea for how to improve adherence. 
We don't do that because we have incentives in the academy which discourage that, because that's lowbrow research rather than highbrow research, which is hypothesis driven. Now, there again, the private sector is eating our lunch. Because what is Google doing? What is Facebook doing? What does Walmart do? They all do research. They use incredible databases on all of us. And they do methodologically sophisticated research. And we need to figure out how to pull that into our space. And I just make one observation about that. We have this incredible thing. Why aren't they in our space? Why haven't they already eaten our lunch? Because in this country, we have HIPAA. So we have the key to all the data. They can't have it, right? <laughs> That doesn't excuse us from learning what they're doing and taking advantage of, we have 12 and a half million patients just in the UC system that we have access to their medical records. Kaiser, another 10 million. We have an opportunity to learn from the best and the worst in the system. Final point, and that is the issue of this sort of valley of death, and it relates to the first two. We've been monitoring for a long time. Monitoring means making sure that nobody's stealing the money and making sure that the program as a whole is producing what it's supposed to produce. I don't care whether it's education or health or outreach to the community or whatever. But if we want to maximize performance, that would be like Starbucks going to its board and saying, here's how much money we spent, here's how many cups of coffee we serve, right? That's not performance management. Starbucks knows exactly how many coffees are produced in every one of its stores and they know how much it costs to run that store, right? We don't operate public health or health care like that. We don't know what the efficiency is at the level of the man where it's managerially relevant, the clinic for HIV care, for example. And we need to learn from the private sector. It's harder for us, but let me just give you, the, and I'll close with an HIV example there too. What do we want to know about whether an HIV clinic is covering its population? We have a good indicator. What is the CD4 count on average of every patient coming into each clinic? Not at the level of the system, at the level of the clinic. The ones that are treating patients with low CD4 counts are not covering their population well. What, have we, what, what, do we, what one indicator could we ask to say, is the clinic successful in treating HIV in its population? Well, what proportion of their patients are virally suppressed? So how is it possible that we don't know, for every HIV clinic domestically or internationally, that we fund with billions and billions of dollars those two simple statistics, because those data exist in every one of those clinics, right? And we could use those two simple statistics to know who are the best performers and the worst performers, and then the system will respond by emulating the best ones and learning from them. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank my friend and colleague, Jaime Sepulveda, and congratulate him for this extraordinary uh, event. Jaime and I were uh, classmates in medical school and there was a, a third classmate of ours, um, Jose Luis Bobadilla, and today marks the 18th anniversary of his untimely death. So I thought, given all his contributions to the topic of this panel, that I would like to, to mention that and, and honor his memory. Um, we're all here because um, we all believe in the value of knowledge as the truly, uh, the only way we have to produce enlightened social transformation. There are other forces for social transformation, but it's not enlightened. The forces of ignorance, of prejudice, uh, and we think that knowledge actually can lead to enlightened social transformation. So the question is, how do we, how do we channel that force? We also talk a lot about health system strengthening. Not health system as a reified thing that we can't really understand, Health system as the vehicle for the organized response that every society articulates to its health challenges. Well, the only way we can uh, strengthen health systems is if we use the value of knowledge, and that requires uh, the systematic, conscientious use of good evidence, both to guide uh, the design, the implementation, and then the evaluation of those reform efforts. Reforms uh, should be seen most of most, more, more than anything else, as experiments. Experiments that then need to be documented and evaluated for the benefit of every other initiative, both present and future. And if you think about that, one of our challenges is we have a limited set of countries in the world. So a health reform is a relatively rare event. If we don't have an organized uh, process around the world, uh, then we miss the chance to learn both from successes and, most importantly, from failures, which are probably the most important sources of lessons. 
But that doesn't happen spontaneously. And my main message today is that every time we undertake large-scale reform of health systems, we need to embed an evaluation component into the design of the reform. Very often, evaluations are an afterthought. And by then, it's too late. You didn't you know, have baseline measurements. You have complete confusion. Uh, and it's the notion of embedded evaluation uh, that I, I think can be a powerful uh, um, a notion. Uh, and I'm just going to take a minute to illustrate with the case of the recent health reform that happened in Mexico, um, starting in, in 2003 uh, with a legislative approval and then implemented as of 2004, for, and that actually embodied this idea of embedded evaluation. This reform started with uh, scientifically derived evidence and culminated with rigorous evaluation. And I think we need to build this virtuous cycle between using existing evidence and then always closing with new uh, evidence that then is not adopted but adapted to local circumstances. And then that then feeds back if we do the evaluation into the global pool of knowledge so that we can engage in a process of shared learning. And this turns then knowledge into a global public good. And I'll say a little bit at the end about that. Why, why is this important? We have been in the perfect storm when it comes to, uh, to health systems. Every health system in the world fails to meet the expectations and requirements of its citizens. I still have to be shown a country that where the vast majority of people think they have a great health system. Uh, it, it, it's almost a, a universal truth that health systems are consistently failing to meet the expectation and needs of its populations. And we have a perfect storm. We've gone through the most complex, we're going through the most complex epidemiologic and demographic transition that has shattered all the previous simple ideas about priorities and has created a very mixed picture of double and triple burdens of disease. We're in an era of in incredibly fast technological innovation. And we're in, in, in an era also of population empowerment. And as Harvey was reminding us in his brilliant opening remarks, the notion of human of access to, to those innovations has become embedded in the idea of human rights. So the convergence of all of that has led to countries all over the world to search for better ways of organizing, financing, delivering uh, high quality healthcare with financial protection for all, for all. And since we've been talking about pandemics, there's also a pandemic of health reforms. Uh, it's um, uh, a, a specter crossing around the world. And uh, if we don't take the opportunities for each of those cases to be studied, then we fail to produce that global uh, public good. Um, as we're speaking, you know, the United States is deeply involved in uh, a major transformation of its health system. China has culminated the largest expansion, expansion of health insurance in human history. Um, and Mexico was part of that movement. Um, and it started with the uh, application, local application, of global public goods, knowledge related global public goods. Instruments that had been developed in the latter part of the 20th century, like cost effectiveness analysis, like national health accounts, like burden of disease methods, like uh, income and expenditure surveys. Um, and it was the convergence of those knowledge related public goods with good local data and a long term investment in analytical capacity that led to what I have defined as a textbook case of um, evidence driven health policy. In Mexico, like in many parts of the world, there was the preconception that we had a publicly funded system. And it was not until we gathered those evidence that it became clear that contrary to com common belief, we actually had a system where the main source of funding was out-of-pocket expenditures that were leading about four million people, four million families, sorry, into bankruptcy in order to deal with, uh, to deal with an episode of illness, to pay for, for health care or, or drugs. So this is a great example of evidence. Evidence, the root of the word means to make something visible. And very often these elements are invisible. And through good evidence, we make the invisible visible. So a topic that was not in, not forget the political agenda, it was not even in, in the global, in the uh, public's consciousness, became visible because of the application of these methodologies. Uh, I won't tell the story that drove a very profound reform that introduced uh, a, publicly, a, a new public insurance scheme that led to a whole uh, uh, reform to increase by one full percentage point of GDP, public expenditures 
in health over a period of eight years um, that uh, uh, developed an explicit set of entitlements, of packages of benefits that were very carefully designed based on, on good evidence so that uh, there was a package of about 260 interventions, essential interventions, and then a separate 60 high-cost interventions for, uh, in a separate form for, for uh, catastrophic health expenditures. And a story of expansion that uh, culminated, or has culminated now uh, in, in present day with about 54 million people enrolled in this new public insurance scheme called Seguro Popular. There's been more than 100 papers published on this, so I'm not going to describe it, and I believe many people in the audience are familiar. What I'd like to stress here was the innovation of having embedded evaluation in the design, and here we follow the lead from a prior experience that has also become very uh, well known globally, which was the case of the conditional cash transfer program uh, called uh, Oportunidades. And where, again, thanks to the uh, vision of another dear friend, also unfortunately gone, Jose Gomez de Leon, had this notion of embedding in the design a rigorous uh, controlled evaluation. And what happened here, and I think this is the generalized um, lesson around the world, is that large-scale reforms, usually both for logistical and financial um, reasons, have to be introduced or implemented in a phased manner. They cannot be executed all at once. And that creates a window of opportunity, and this was the insight of uh, Dr. Gomez de Leon, a window of opportunity when you can, what, what he did was to match communities and then randomly uh, allocate communities that would go into the first stage of adoption of this large-scale conditional cash transfer program and communities that would go in the second. And by that random allocation, it was possible not just to document the changes, but to attribute the changes to the intervention itself. And that's that insight that the gradualism of implementation allows you that window to control randomized allocation uh, to, to have a, a, a strong design. By the way, doing randomization not only does for a very robust design, it also protects the decision of which communities go in and which go second. It protects them from political manipulation, which is what would happen if you didn't have this uh, element of evaluation embedded. So it's both a scientifically rigorous and an ethically very valid way of approaching the problem of gradual implementation, which is the norm. Um, we did exactly the same thing uh, in a very uh, large study that uh, Chris Murray was a part of and uh, led by Gary King and Emanuela Gagiru, and which has been called the largest randomized uh, social uh, trial uh, to date. It was possible to do exactly that idea, use that window of gradual implementation. I won't go into the details. This has been extensively uh, documented in, in the literature. Um, but the results, even at an early um, measurement after the baseline, show positive results in terms of um, reaching the poorest, in terms of financial protection, protecting families from catastrophic expenditures. And that leads me to a second message. Interestingly, this exercise that might look to be very technocratic became a very, or acquired a huge political value. Because in the change of government, the fact that there had been a rigorous evaluation protected the program from the usual temptation of politicians to stop things that are working just because they want to bring new stuff, uh, no matter if that means dismantling things. And that program has now survived two changes of government, and I think a big part of that is because evaluation was embedded in the design. It was not just the randomized trial. I think we developed a balanced portfolio uh, between observational and controlled trials. Uh, so we didn't get into the um, debate between the randomistas and the uh, observationalists. Uh, but, I, but, but I think it's an example of what I hope we would do uh, the most. I will close by saying that it's not enough to do this country by country. National action is very important, but this really requires collective action. We talk about strengthening national health systems, I think we also need to strengthen the global health system. And I do see a crisis in the lack of funding of knowledge-related global public goods. The crisis with Ebola, as Jaime said this morning, is just a symptom of a much deeper problem, which has been the underfunding of knowledge-related global public goods, the development of methodologies, the development of 
standards and development of comparative analysis that would allow to produce this process of shared learning. It would be, it's unrealistic and inefficient to think that each country undertaking its own reforms will do this on its own. This really is a failure of the global health system that we need um, to fix. But there's no movement, there's no advocacy for the international global, no, uh, global uh, public goods that are knowledge related. Uh, I think we need to step up to that and I hope we can engage more in the discussion. The key then is to fund these public goods and engage in the process of shared learning across countries because failure here, lack of capacity to learn from previous uh, uh, successes and especially from previous mistakes, carries the cost of millions, millions of unnecessary uh, debts. When we do that, we will finally turn knowledge into the most potent force for enlightened social transformation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. I've crossed the world for my first time in San Francisco to spend a day locked up in a room with no windows. <laughs> um, the bonus of this room is it's filled with great names of global health past, and I hope great names of global health what's next. How you can distinguish between global health past and global what's next is those who are on Twitter. <laughs> with the possible exception of Peter Singer, who seems to have crossed both camps. <laughs> So thank you especially to the three wise men organizing this event, Jaime, Haile, and Richard. It's really a, a fantastic event um, and a real uh, honor and a credit to you and to what you're doing here. It seems that Sir Richard may now be King James, <laughs> the first. And uh, he is from my current institution, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So we would be very jealous of this fantastic campus that you have here, fantastic space. We have to resort to digging down into our basement to lock up our mosquitoes and insectaries there because we're out of space. I, I normally get to talk about babies and mothers. <laughs> I got bumped off the babies and mothers panel into the middle of the data panel. <laughs> And I suspect I got dropped into the middle of this panel because it seems to be part of what I call a little syndrome of WWM, which is wise white men. <laughs> and I do hope that in Global Health What's Next, we will move a little bit from WWM to WWW. <laughs> And even more important, I hope that we will have a lot more people from Africa and Asia who are the people who are meant to be leading these issues. So what you can't tell from looking at me and thinking I'm a small white woman is I'm actually an African woman. So I was born in the bush of northern Uganda. I just collected the wrong color of skin on the way out. <laughs> And because we haven't got any time, I can't tell you that story. <laughs> but of the questions that I, we were given today, we seem to be talking about measurement methods and measurement systems, and then we get to talk about the results. So I'm the one woman on the panel. I got the fluffy question. So I decided I wouldn't answer the fluffy question because it looks like none of the WWMs are answering their question either. <laughs> <laughs> But I will try to stick to time. Um, so I want to leave you with three questions. First of all, this is about measurement. Who actually does the measurement in global health? Is it the right people? Secondly, who are we actually measuring for? And thirdly, whose data actually is it? So first of all, who does the measurement in global health? Well, I'm afraid it's WWMs. <laughs> and whatever metric we look at in metrics publication, whether that's epidemiology, whether it's lots of estimates, whether it's trials, whether it's evaluations, whether it's systematic reviews, safely, even with any range of uncertainty, more than 90% of first authors and senior authors are from high-income in countries. But we look at the burden, and where's the burden? Well, safely, more than 90% of most burdens, maybe a, a few exceptions, are in low and middle income countries. So it's one of our famous 10, 90 gaps. 90% of the burden, 10% of the leadership in metrics, 
even looking around this room. It's, a, it's not a good reflection on where we want to be. So what's next? It will not happen by Brownian motion that the leadership of metrics transfers to where the burden is. It's going to take an intentional shift in our incentive structures for publication, for funding. It's going to take a different approach by donors. Donors love to fund innovation, <laughs> but their idea of innovation usually is a new gadget, a new vaccine, something that will address Ebola. But donors do not like to fund PhDs for people from Africa so that they can become metrics leaders. Why is Asia, why is Latin America making faster progress in many ways than Africa? Yes, Africa has a higher burden, 12% of the world's population, more than half of maternal deaths, more than half of child deaths, many other burdens that are heavy on Africa. But it's also because we've said that tertiary education and investing in people skills in Africa is a luxury. It is not. We don't wait until we've sorted the other things out <coughs> and then invest in higher level leadership in Africa. We need to start doing that so that we can address Ebola, so that we can change things, and so it's changed from there. And yet donors don't want to hear that. And so how will that change? Well, I think the best examples actually come out of Latin America. Brazil, the government invested in 1,000 PhDs for public health capacity. How do we get things to change in Africa? I've been in South Africa for most of the last 10 years. I found the secret word to get the government to do things differently was to say, in Brazil. <laughs> now the South African government is also funding public health PhDs. We need to do that intentionally. It won't happen by Brownian motion. So who does the measurement? The center of gravity needs to change. Who do we measure for? Do we measure for Ban Ki-moon? Do we measure for the UN? Do we measure for Bill and Melinda, who've funded personally out of their own pocket much of the new wave of global health? Do we measure for USAID, the biggest donor in the world at the moment? Do we measure for the bank? 10 years ago, before the economic collapse, donors were talking about measuring contribution. Now they're back to attribution. How many lives has my investment saved? It's a backwards shift. Really, it's not the donors. It should be exactly what Julio Frank has been talking about. Measurement within systems to evaluate change of that system and not taking second-rate evaluation within that, but thinking about how we can much more rigorously do that at scale. Thirdly, who do the metrics belong to? Well, when we read Lancet most weeks, we would think that they belong to WWMs. <laughs> but that would be going back to a neo-colonial era. That's not the case. Do they belong to UN metrics? Well, we've heard about the, the dearth of investment in the UN. Where are the cavalry from WHO? Where's the leadership in metrics from WHO? It's a sad statement. I don't think there's anybody from WHO at this meeting. Do they belong to countries? Actually, they don't even belong to country governments. They should belong to the families whose mother has died, whose child has died. Each of those metrics about a death should be used to prevent the next death in those communities. Each year, five and a half million babies enter and leave the world without a birth or a death certificate. Stillbirths, neonatal deaths. They don't count in an era where we measure the human genome. <laughs> and yet we can't organize ourselves to give a piece of paper to make sure that a birth and a death count. But the world is changing. Three quarters of births are in facilities. Half of births now get a, a birth certificate. There's a gap there get a birth certificate, but fewer get a death certificate. So there is something that we need to do differently. Who does the measurement? If we don't act intentionally, that 90-10 gap will still be here when we get to 2030. We will still be having people measuring 
in other people's countries instead of those countries having leaders who have the capacity to measure and lead change. Who do we measure for? We need to shift our measurement to be measuring within the system so it's actually for that system for change. Who does the data belong to? We have to remember that it's actually about the people who have suffered that burden. That's who it belongs to. It's not for us, it's not for our publication, it's not for our future. It's for a change where it matters most. And I want to finish by going back to Mark Rosenberg's points on collaboration earlier. When I was at CDC about 15 years ago, I had a privilege of taking a class with him and, and Bill Fagey. Uh, and there was one thing that Bill Fagey said that really stuck with me. There's no limit to what could be done in global health if we cared less about who got the credit. It's about our own attitude. It's not just about pointing to other people not changing. How can we change the future of metrics? It'll take those three shifts in who is measuring, who are we measuring for, and who owns the data. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jaime, for inviting me. This is a great event. It's wonderful to celebrate this uh, new campus, new building, new initiative. I am actually going to try to stick to the question. Uh, <laughs> I am going to uh, agree with staff to say that uh, we need to do far more than just understand efficacy in well-designed randomized trials, whether they're for technologies for, or for policies. We actually need to keep track of when those interventions or policies get implemented. Are we achieving what we thought we would get? And I think a nice little illustration is the current debate about insecticide-treated bed nets. Well-conducted uh, cluster randomized trials prove the efficacy of uh, ITNs for reducing child mortality. Three different sites, very compelling. We've had a massive scale up of bed nets. And yet this year we have uh, Noor et al's publication, investigators from Kenya, I might say, uh, showing in a very careful geospatial analysis that there were countries like Malawi or DRC that have had 50, 60 percent scale up of bed nets, but no change in the plasmodium falciparum parasite rate. The sort of disconnect between what descriptive data can tell us uh, over time from are we actually getting what's promised in the well-conducted trials. And there's lots of reasons why we can imagine that disconnect occurring. Bed nets go to the wrong people, they don't get used, uh, and there may be just fundamental measurement issues. So I think there's enormous value in straight, boring, descriptive epi of measuring the right outcomes over time across community in the most detailed manner possible, finest geography possible, and over long periods of time. Now, I think one, uh, probably the, the largest undertaking that uh, attempts to do this is the current iteration of the Global Burden of Disease Collaboration. And this, for those of you who don't follow this, has evolved now into a annual enterprise. This will be the first annual update this year. It's already started to come out in journals and in other places. It covers 1,500 different clinical outcomes uh, caused by 300 diseases. The analysis is currently country by country, although China, the UK, and Mexico have collaborated rather extensively to drill down to the next level, to province, to state, and to region. And there's a number of other countries in the coming years that will be doing the same thing. It also covers risk factors. So you get part of the causal chain around behaviors, uh, environmental exposures, as well as metabolic risk factors. And one hopes in the future that we'll be soon adding social and economic determinants. Uh, these results are published in journals, both to make sure they are peer-reviewed, uh, they're subject to scrutiny, but they're also dominantly released to the world as a public good through online data visualizations that I'm happy to say get extensively used both for teaching and for policy use, uh, as well as a, a more targeted set of policy reports with institutions like the World Bank or, or particular governments. I think Joy was made some really good points, but I think it's a little outdated because I'm glad to say that the GBD now represents a collaboration of 1,080 investigators in 106 countries, the majority of which are from the developing world. 
And if you look, for example, at the publications this year from the GBD, whether they're in JAMA or the Lancet, uh, again, the majority of the first authors are from the developing world. So I think there's real progress there in going from small committees of people doing this analysis to a truly global effort to synthesize the world's uh, understanding of uh, epidemiology. The other advantage of the annual updating process for the GBD as a tool to track this sort of uh, what's happening in the world is that as new data comes online or better methods that anybody in the world comes up with or new understanding of etiology, those can be relatively rapidly incorporated and errors in past efforts uh, can be corrected. Uh, one example of the use of the burden of disease that I have to uh, advertise, because Jaime told me to, uh, is our piece in, in this special issue that was prepared for uh, in science, uh, using a sort of high-level view of the GBD to look at some broad patterns. Now, I think the, the interesting thing is what's next in using descriptive epidemiology to keep us all on track of understanding where either things are not happening that we thought should happen, the bed net case, or things are happening but we don't really understand why. Countries are making huge progress but we don't have a simple explanation. It's not necessarily intervention scale up. Zulfi talked about it this morning, that you know, we always underestimate sort of in a cyclical way the importance of educational progress for women particularly. And it comes back now as we see examples where it's really hard to understand except through these broad socioeconomic drivers some of the progress that we observe. But the power of this descriptive data by place and by time becomes uh, even greater when you start to do the sort of things that Dean Jameson has been talking about uh, in the Commission on Investing in Health, where you line up the spend in the past and what's been achieved. Simple examples uh, for the special envoy for the health-related MDGs has uh, catalyzed some calculations of saying, well, we know child mortality has been going down in the last few years. We know how much governments have spent and how much donors have spent, approximately. There's lots of uncertainty in there. What's been the cost per child life averted? And the good news is in low-income countries, it could be as low as $5,000. Uh, depending on how much of the progress we think is due to things other than what the health system does. And in middle-income countries, it's still rather attractive, but costs something more like $200,000 to avert a child's life. You can start to do that calculation for malaria, for HIV, and for a number of other interventions, and then do what Steph started us off with, which is start to drill down on why are some places able to achieve more or achieve more or the same amount at a lower cost, are there lessons that we can learn there? And I think we barely started to scratch the surface of using uh, that sort of strategy to get insights on or lessons learned to transfer to other places. Last, somewhat tangential here, I will d divert from the questions uh, and just do an unabashed advertisement, which is <laughs> The GBD collaboration is always looking for new collaborators. Uh, it's a very open process, and that's how it's grown so dramatically in the last two or three years. And so anybody here uh, from anywhere that is interested in contributing to a better understanding of descriptive epi, please uh, join this collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Why don't we uh, open it up to questions uh, while we're waiting for our first volunteers to come up. Could you expand a little bit more on heterogeneity and experiments of nature and trying to capture that better? You might want to turn your microphone on. Too. Perfect. <laughs> I think that in the healthcare system, just to take an example within this country, um, we worry a lot about how well we're dealing with diabetes. And we're looking at what are the determinants of good glycemic control? And I think that we, have, we at the research that I'm aware of at Berkeley and UCSF, have looked at the performance of different health plans throughout the state. You can see huge amounts of heterogeneity between the different health plans in the state, and that's already heavily aggregated because that's the result of multiple clinics and hospitals. So just starting with the question of why are Kaiser and the Chinese Community Health Plan so much better than so many other plans in the state? One level below that, we have clinics that are superb in some and others that are not. And it seems to me that 
to the extent that we start revealing those data so people understand within the system in a way that's not penalizing people because obviously some people are working with much more difficult populations than others, to the extent that we start doing that, we will naturally improve. And, you know, Eric Usby, who's here, did that in Mozambique with PEPFAR. And he looked at how the cost variability across clinics per person treated with antiretrovirals was before people knew what it was. A year later, once that heterogeneity was revealed, not only was the mean substantially better, but the variability had shrunk to a tenth of what it was yeah. before that revealing. And I think that that's, it's such a powerful tool that we are just not using. And one reason we're not using it, surprisingly, is that because we still think data are expensive. But they're not expensive anymore. Data are cheap now. So we need to adapt ourselves to the, the Google world, and we're still operating in the idea that every additional person observed is very expensive. That's not true anymore. Thank you. Uh, questions from the audience? Well, I just want to point out to the students here, Dean Bertozzi's correct use of the Latin plural of datum. <laughs> Impressive. Um, hi, I'm Jesse Schomburg. I'm also a student from Toro, and I'm also here with some friends today from Global Physicians Corps. And um, thanks, Jaime, for inviting me. This is great. Just kidding, I'm not invited. I just got an email. <laughs> but this is amazing. Um, but your, um, actually, Joy, your point to me really hit hard, you know, talking about WWWs and WWMs and whatever, you know, just in general, you know, coming from a Western culture and a university and going to another country, and this summer we were doing schistosomiasis research in Tanzania, and while it was amazing, you know, it's, sustainability is so important, and we did do um, a lot of research on the sustainability of our programs, and while they are, wor they are working, you know, if we left, they're not necessarily going to be taking care of themselves yet. So my question for you is, how do we get countries to involve themselves in these projects with us together? And, you know, part of that is, you know, asking them what they want, but really, you know, I even feel like the funding, while it is important and it's you know great to see all these donors and compassionate giving people, we really need the resources from those countries as well for, to see kind of that true investment. And a lot of the organizations that we look up to, I think any young medical student, you hear about Partners in Health and you want to go work in Haiti, but the, one of the amazing things about Partners in Health is that they have so many Haitian doctors and nurses in their hospital. And you know, same thing with, uh, you know, Village uh, HealthWorks, you know, that community built that clinic on their own. And so how do we promote more of those partnerships in getting, um, you know, just these countries to really invest in public health? And how do we assist them? Thank you. Dr. Lon, that sounds like a question for you. <laughs> well, I'll take part of what you said as a, as a comment in terms of listening to people in, in what they want to do and what they want to invest in. Um, but I think also the points that have been made about true collaboration um, and a point to what uh, Chris is also saying about that shift in moving from WWM to having a much broader collaboration and countries running their own burden and being able to, their own burden estimates, but being able to also see those to drive the evidence. Point to what Julio has said about that the learning from uh, Mexico on sometimes looking too much at dichotomies. And one of the, the richest things I think that came out of the learning from the Mexico series was how people tend to bash vertical investments and say you should do horizontal only, but how do we move to the diagonal? And I think that's exactly what you're looking for, that the purely project-based approach versus the purely horizontal approach, how can we start in these settings where sometimes it is a project-based approach because that is, in some cases, the only thing to do, but intentionally ensure that we don't stay in that world but move towards building systems and building people over time. Thank you. A question over here, please. Great panel, great discussion. I particularly like the questions about who measures, who do we measure for. There was one question I didn't hear, how much do we measure? Is there a point at which it becomes too much measurement, the cost becomes too much? How do we know when to stop measuring? You have to measure it. <laughs> oh, by the way, my name is Anurag Merrill. Measure your measurement. <laughs> measure how much you measure it. Well, since you jumped in here. <laughs> no, 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 I, I'll leave that to uh, <laughs> Mr. Health Metrics. <laughs> 
how much is too much, Chris? How, well, we're so far away from that. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we don't have to figure that out. I think the, the you know, I think too much is when there, there's no interest or demand from people who are actually making decisions, mm -hmm. whether they're local or national, in the results. And I don't think we're close to that. I think it's always the opposite, whether you're talking to a, you know, a county public health officer in the U.S. or a minister of health, they're always asking questions that we really can't answer. Uh, whether it's about what works, uh, what's the top set of, you know, the best options for them in their particular context. So, sadly, we have a ways to go before we have too much. Well, that may or may not be true, Stephanie. <laughs> it might be too much some places and not I don't, other I don't like it when people <laughs> expect a single answer to that. I know you don't either. Um, I think it's very similar to the answer of how much you do spend on fundraising. The answer is until you get to the point where it costs you more than it's getting you. So I think in terms of measurement, it's the same kind of thing. You know, the arguments that I made about um, measurement to, to improve the performance, you only spend on that until the gains in performance are less than the cost of the measurement. But I agree with Chris. We're so far from that in what we do that we don't have to worry about it for a long time. As they say in anesthesiology, you titrate, titrate to effect. <laughs> Thank you. Please. Hello, everyone. My name is Obiezi Nzewa. Um, I think I actually represent the Generation Next because I belong to the 2014-2015 Global Health Class. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody? <laughs> OK. Um, in addition to that, I'm Nigerian. So I could relate exactly to what um, one of our presenters was saying when she was saying there is a huge difficulty in getting the knowledge across. There is a wide gap between what is known here and what is known in Africa. And I also strongly believe that it's going to be continually difficult for us to keep giving because resources are finite. We have to get to a point where we need to make Africans or African countries or low-income countries responsible for their own health. And if we don't get to that point, the resources are going to get finished at some point. So I believe that's the challenge, that's where we are. But my question is, how do you go around um, creating this impact or these interventions in areas where you have um, governments that are not quite um, transparent or you have issues with um, corruption? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone want to talk about uh, problematic governments? <laughs> <laughs> Julio does. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, part of the value of, um, of measurement, you know, it's a little bit what I was talking about, the political value. It, it is a tool of accountability. You, 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 you cannot even detect those problems if you're not measuring. And, you know, there's the form of corruption that means stealing money, but there's a worse form of corruption, which is launching ineffective programs. Uh, squandering scarce resources that have huge opportunity costs, especially in poor countries, uh, but also in rich countries. I mean, the problem in the United States of, of the, the magnitude of waste, I mean, the estimates of waste are equivalent to the whole GDP of Great Britain, right? I mean, it's, and, and, and uh, that's, a, that's a, a form of systematic government failure that you don't get to even perceive, let alone correct, if you do not measure. So the value of measurement is that it is a way of casting light uh, into parts of society, so, social, including governmental operation, that otherwise would remain, as I say, evidence means to make visible. And that's the origin, that's the Latin word, it comes from videre, which means to see. And that's the value of getting evidence. It allows you to bring things to be seen. So, you know, as we try to build sustainable democracies, uh, measurement is absolutely critical for accountability. And can I add a quick addendum to that? I think we can't say that's an excuse, because if we use the example of heterogeneity, there are some extremely uh, weak governance countries that have managed to beat MDG 4 and 5. I would highlight Bangladesh, that's very low on transparency international uh, ranking, and yet has met MDG 4 and 5. So I think more rigorous analysis of how countries where governance is weak have succeeded are very important, particularly for your discussion in, in Nigeria. Sadly, our final question, please. Hi there. Thank you uh, so much for having me, first of all. Um, I'm part of the class of 2014, 
And uh, continuing on that bandwagon, first of all, I can't even believe I'm standing talking in front of all these people. <laughs> And second of all, um, I find this talk very interesting. I'm a registered nurse from Canada, and I've been very clinically based for most of my profession. And I feel like in this talk, there is a little bit of a disconnect between data and measurement and what actually happens at the clinical level and how we can connect those two together to achieve these goals that everyone has been talking about. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to that and um, at the clinician level or at the program level and, and how this information is, is going to be used to bridge that gap. And if there is a successful program or a successful example that you could use to illustrate that. So, so Berkeley is the only public health school in the United States that also has a school of medicine. So we'll let Dr. Bertotzi talk about it. It doesn't have a school of medicine. It does have a school of medicine. <laughs> The, um, the, the <laughs> embedded at the School of Public Health. He's forgotten six, about it already. The, the, <laughs> our joint medical program, 16 students a year. Uh, that's what George is referring to. Um, you know, I, I'm going to answer your question, your, your question obliquely. Um, I, I think one of the problems that we have in terms of how we deal with data, we work in an academic environment where for us to be able to publish and disseminate the results of our work, we have to be 95% certain of the results. And yet, you in clinical practice are very rarely 95% certain that what you're doing is the right thing to do. And in the business world, almost never is a decision maker making, and in the political world, virtually <laughs> never <laughs> are you 95% certain. Although they certain. always behave like that. So I, I think that for me what your question does is it raises this issue of how do we inform the decisions that are better than a flip of a coin and less certain than 95% in a more rigorous and systematic way that learns from lots of things? It learns from prospective randomized trials, it learns from cluster randomized experiments, but it also learns from the heterogeneity of what actually happens. So why are some of your fellow nurses better able to do things than others and what can we learn from that? And I think the challenge is then bringing that information back so it's not just, what feels for me terribly disconnected if I think of the time in the clinic, is that you're only reading journal articles about things which are 95% certain and what proportion of what I do is affected by that. I think in the management space, we've figured out much better how to use rigor in a way that is not absolutist at the 95% level. We have the challenge of doing that in medicine and with clinical practice. Rigor without rigor. Right? Can I? So. <laughs> Let me Thank you in. all very uh, much. It's been. Uh, a, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I just wanted to follow up on Steph with a, a an example right now that is an illustration of this disconnect about evidence. So, obesity, big epidemic. Lots of countries trying to think about what to do about obesity. Uh, Public Health England trying to come up with a strategy. National Institute for Clinical es Excellence in the UK, nice. Uh, fantastic systematic review of the evidence, but very clinically oriented, mm -hmm. and concluded that gastric banding is the way to go to <laughs> deal with obesity. And obviously that's just of no relevance to dealing with obesity at a, as a public health problem in the UK. And there's just this cultural mismatch between mm -hmm. going, in this case, the other direction, where the sort of rigor arm on the clinical side mm -hmm. is very high, and therefore you exclude all the things for which the evidence is incomplete. And on the flip side, you just can't make public policy on that basis. So just a, a real, real time example of what Steph was trying to say. With that, I'd like to thank our, our panelists. Thank you to the audience very much for your attention. And